بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. إن شاء الله continuing with our study of the life of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم السيرة النبوية the prophetic biography. So إن شاء الله today we'll be starting the tenth year of Hijra. This is the tenth year of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم's residence in the city of Medina. Now I know that for quite a few of the previous sessions, we've been talking about uh, the ninth year, Amul Wufud, where all the different delegations were coming to visit the Prophet ﷺ. By no means have we uh, talked about or covered all the different delegations that came. Um, of course, there's benefit uh, in studying it. However, to quite an extent, a lot of the accounts of the delegation are simply just names of the tribes, the places where they were from, the fact that they came to Medina, they embraced Islam, they accepted Islam, and that's essentially the gist of it. And so there's a number of different tribes that we did not uh, touch upon, but suffice it to say, there were dozens upon dozens of tribes that came during that particular particular year to come embrace Islam, accept Islam, and go back to their people. And that's essentially what led to kind of this um, really exponential growth uh, of the Ummah and the spread of Islam during that time. So it is very important and quite beneficial to note the fact that um, something we've talked about to quite an extent, something that was written very uh, incorrectly, completely, absolutely, factually incorrect. And actually it's quite tragic as well that it was written by the Orientalists and many of the Europeans uh, during the 16, 17, 1800s. Uh, and this of course continued on in the West in the 1900s and even up till now, where they incorrectly, they, 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 they misportrayed the spread of Islam, and we've all heard the phrases of Islam being spread by the sword, so on and so forth. But when you read, uh, even going back to the time of the Prophet وسلم, you're finding that these are delegations and tribes that are coming of their own accord to come to ask questions about the religion and about the faith and then to embrace Islam and take it back to their people. So we're, there was this very natural, organic spread and growth of Islam that led to the entire Arabian Peninsula essentially um, being covered completely by the faith and the religion and the practice of Islam. That being said, we're now going to proceed into the 10th year of Hijrah. The 10th year of the Prophet Sallallahu residence in the city of Medina, and what is also the last full year of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Now there are quite a few monumental events during this 10th year that we're going to talk about. For instance, we're going to talk about Hajjat al wida the farewell pilgrimage. We're going to talk about the Prophet ﷺ journeying to Tabuk, the, fir the final, last major expedition of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. So we'll talk about all those things. But what we're going to start with today is something that was actually quite remarkable. And in and of itself, it doesn't seem like it was that eventful. But nevertheless, it is quite significant. And that is, we had talked about that in the previous couple of sessions, we had touched on the fact that amongst the people that were coming to Medina and embracing Islam, there were people from the area, the region known as Yemen, which was even known as Yemen at that particular time as well. And in the previous session, we had touched on how there was a prince, part of the royalty of Yemen had come and embraced Islam as well. So essentially the result of that was that now in Yemen, you had a significant number of Muslims and Islam was continuing to spread in that region. What that necessitated, what that required was the presence of a representative of the Prophet Sallallahu someone who could could teach people the religion, answer their questions, and also establish a system of governance there that would report back to Medina, would, would be connected back to the headquarters of Islam at that time, and that is the city of the Prophet Al-Madinatul Munawwara. 
And that particular individual that the Prophet ﷺ, he would send others as well, but the first individual that the Prophet ﷺ um, appointed to go there to Yemen as his official ambassador and representative, continue preaching and spreading the faith, educate those who have come into the religion, and also establish a system of governance and connect Yemen very, um, you know, connected very meaningfully back to the city of Medina, the, the major kind of seat of Islam at that time, where the Prophet ﷺ was, of course. And so the Prophet ﷺ sending Mu'ad bin Jabal to Yemen, when I say it's not that eventful, I mean that there wasn't any particular dramatic uh, event that occurred. But rather, the Prophet ﷺ sends Mu'ad bin Jabal to Yemen. He goes there stays there for some time, preaches, spreads, teaches the religion, and then eventually comes back to Medina. But the reason why it is very significant and important to talk about this particular moment is that, number one, this is one of the first major instances where you have now the Prophet ﷺ sending what we would basically refer to as a governor, is basically sending an official representative of the state to go and to establish a system of governance in another region, number one. Number two, the Prophet ﷺ is also not just sending a simple government representative, a delegate, but the Prophet ﷺ is also sending what can be called an imam. Somebody who is his representative, an, an, an appointed imam by the Prophet ﷺ, appointed by him to go there and represent him in terms of spiritual religious teachings and continue to spread the faith, teach the faith. And one very, again, it might seem like a minor thing in terms of religious function, but think about the significance of it. He's also sending him there, and we'll cover the conversation, where he's also sending him there to answer any questions that they might have, address their religious issues and concerns, what we basically call issuing fatwa, fatawa. And that might seem, again, like I said, just a minor function of a religious authority. Yeah, you give fatwa. Your local scholar gives you a fatwa. So what's the big deal? But the big deal here is that this is someone who is now being licensed by the Prophet ﷺ, certified by him, to actually be giving religious rulings and answering people's religious questions during the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. And that's what makes it quite significant. And so you see here, before I go any further into the specific instance of Mu'adh, what you see here is part of the execution of the vision of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ, of course, we as Muslims understand this, but it's important to elaborate and to touch on this as well. And it is by no surprise or shock to us that the Prophet ﷺ is a visionary. And the Prophet ﷺ had this vision of establishing an ummah. And part of establishing an ummah was that the ummah would exist in different places and regions. And they needed to have a system of governance. And at the same time, the ummah would spread. And there needed to be qualified individuals who could continue to not only preach, teach, but also address the religious and spiritual life issues of people after the Prophet ﷺ was gone. And a truly visionary teacher and leader and, and um, a, a mentor is not someone who is just teaching people for when they're gone, then those people can hopefully pick up the pieces and carry on. But that is somebody who actually puts people to work while that person is still there to actually build and build up a system so that that system is completely in place and when that leader is no longer available, then it continued, the machine continues to operate. Now of course in the instance of the Prophet ﷺ, it never will be the same. The departure of the Prophet ﷺ, in the words of the companions themselves, is the greatest tragedy that ever befell the Ummah. Right? Abdullah bin Masood says that they felt like all the light was sucked out of this world. We all, like a part of all of us died that day. Right? Nothing would ever replace the Prophet But you still have to admire. And you are just completely taken aback, awe, filled with awe at how that when the Prophet ﷺ left this world, as tragic as that moment is, and as irreplaceable as he is, but we still see that basically three days later, 
the ummah continued to function. And that is truly remarkable. That is, that is one of the miracles of the Prophet And something that inspires us to today, till today, and something we need to study very intently, the succession planning of the Prophet So that's another very instance here that, that makes, that's another fact or another issue for, for which this instance is quite remarkable. The last and the final thing, just to explain why we'll be talking about this in depth today, um, is that when the Prophet ﷺ was sending Mu'ad bin Jabal because of how monumentous of an occasion this was, governance is being extended and established, religious authority is being now extended and established in another region, the Prophet ﷺ gave Mu'ad bin Jabal some very, very profound and significant advice. And some of the most beautiful instruction really deep, profound instruction from the Prophet ﷺ was actually given to Mu'ad bin Jabal at this occasion, preparing him for the immense responsibility that he was about to shoulder. And just going through those words of the Prophet ﷺ will be extremely beneficial. That he imparted to his beloved companion Mu'ad bin Jabal So that's why I wanted to touch on it today. So what I will be talking about is, I'll be quoting parts of the conversation of the Prophet ﷺ with Mu'ad bin Jabal So the first thing that I'll mention here is narrated by Imam Bukhari uh, in his Sahih, uh, Ibn Abbas he narrates this, that the Prophet ﷺ, he said to Mu'ad bin Jabal when he was preparing to send him to Yemen, he said, إِنَّكَ سَتَأْتِي قَوْمًا أَهْلَ كِتَابٍ you will be going to a people who are a people of the book. They're Christians and Jews. فَإِذَا جِئْتَكُمْ فَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَىٰ أَنْ يَشْهَدُوا أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَىٰ اللَّهُ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ رَسُولُ اللَّهُ When you go to them, then call them to testify to the oneness of God and to the finality of the messengership and the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He goes on to say, فَإِنْ هُمْ أَطَاعُوا لَكَ بِذَلِكَ If they obey you, if they follow this advice, فَأَخْبِرْهُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ فَرَضَ عَلَيْهِمْ خَمْسَ صَلَوَاتٍ فِي كُلِّ يَوْمٍ وَلَيْلًا Then at that point instruct them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained upon them five daily prayers. So you kind of see the sequence of what to educate people upon and how to establish a religion amongst the people. The first thing is give them a relationship with God. Make sure they have a relationship with Allah. And that is quite profound and we can learn quite a lesson from that as well. That a lot of times we get so much, we get so caught up in imparting minutia of like Muslim culture to people. We start talking to them about, you know, what their name is. And again, that's a justified concern if the name is not Islamically acceptable. Like even at the time of the Prophet if someone's name was Abdul Masih, the slave of Jesus, then of course that name would be changed to Abdul Rahman or something of that sort. But other than that, if the name wasn't, I mean, what was Umar's name before Islam? It was Umar. What was Uthman's name before Islam? It was Uthman. You know, and it's, it's important. However, one of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, her name before Islam was Barra. And that was a name that did not have a suitable meaning, an appropriate meaning. We talked about this in one of the earlier sessions. So the Prophet ﷺ changed it to Zainab. Right? And so if the name is not appropriate, that's a whole other issue. But other than that, if the, we, we get so caught up again, like I'm saying, in the minutia of Muslim culture. We start worrying about what their name is. We start worrying about what they're wearing. And again, if they're wearing something problematic, that's one thing. But if they're just dressed like normal people, then what are we exactly bothering them about? We start, you know, really troubling them with all these different elements of culture. And some things might actually be a part of like our fiqh or certain elements of the sunnah. But think about what you're losing the forest for the trees, right? And so the Prophet ﷺ always gave this advice. If they accept the faith, then the first thing you instruct them on is the five times daily prayer. Teach them to talk to God. Teach them to how to have a relationship with Allah, how to talk to Allah on a daily basis. Once they learn to do that, they follow you in that. Then the Prophet said, once they pick that up, then instruct them that God has ordained upon them charity. Again, build a community. 
that you take this charity from their wealthy and you distribute it to their poor, thereby building a community of empathy and teaching them that all of us are in this together. And that again is quite profound. After faith, then it's establishing community and empathy. Once they learn this and they follow this, then the Prophet ﷺ says, then he gave a few other instruction, instructions that are very profound. He said, He said, listen, when you collect their zakat and their alms, their charity from them, do not take the best of their wealth. Because charity should never feel like a penalty. Charity should never feel like a penalty. Charity is a privilege, it's an honor, it's a good deed, it's a spiritual exercise, it benefits the giver, the taker, the community, everyone. So even at times in, in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, when he sent someone on the outskirts of Medina to, okay, and somebody had to give like one camel in charity. They had 20 camels, so they had to give one camel in charity. Okay, in zakat. And so when that one camel would come, the one time one sahabi came back and the camel seemed like almost like what we call like a prize animal. It seemed really, really of high quality, high caliber. And the Prophet some said, is this the best animal that that person had? And the sahabi probably thinking like, yeah, you know, like he's asking me a question. I'm about to score some points. Yeah, yeah, this was the best camel that person had. The Prophet some said, then take it back. This is zakat, it's not a penalty. And go get a more median camel. Don't bring back the sick, dying, diseased animal. But at the same time, don't take the, the animal that, they, that, that maybe is their means of sustenance, but bring back a median animal. At different times, the Prophet ﷺ instructed that if there's an animal that they primarily use for their food, like an animal that they milk, don't bring that animal. The point of giving charity is not to starve to death. How does that benefit? How does that build community? So that's not the objective. Then the second thing he said was, what took, so as a leader, and as the governor, the Prophet ﷺ is telling him, that don't be harsh with your people and be balanced and fair with your people. Don't make your people hate you. Don't make them hate these institutions of the deen and the religion. But be gentle with them. And then he's reminding him, but also by extension telling him to teach them, but first he's reminding him, it's in the second person singular. It's you. وَالتَّقِي أَنْتَ وَالتَّقِي أَنْتَ دَعْوَةَ الْمَطْلُوبِ You need to be very cautious about the prayer of the oppressed. Be very cautious. Avoid at all costs the dua, the prayer of the oppressed. Don't you dare ever oppress someone. Because when they raise their hands against you, you're done for. So don't do that. فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ حِجَابٍ there's no barrier between the prayer of the oppressed and God. So be very careful. You're being put in charge, but that ain't no walk in the park. You're not being given free reign to do as you please. You are responsible, you are accountable, you are liable. So be very careful, be very cautious. What profound advice from the Prophet ﷺ. Another thing the Prophet ﷺ he told Mu'ad bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu when he was sending, when he was sending him, excuse me, was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam told him, Imam Ahmad narrates in his musnad, narrated by uh, Mu'ad bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu himself, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam told him, مَفَاتِيحُ الْجَنَّةِ شَهَادَةُ أَنْ لَا إِلَّهِ اللَّهِ The keys of paradise, the key to unlocking jannah and paradise for people, is saying la ilaha illallah. The testimony of faith, believing in Allah. And again, the reason why he's emphasizing this to him is that focus on the faith of the people before anything else. Get them to know Allah, get them to recognize Allah. That's the path to salvation. That's the road to redemption. La ilaha illallah. In another narration that is a very famous narration, Mu'ad bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu asked, the Prophet ﷺ. There's a couple of different versions of this. The version in the book of Imam At-Tirmidhi in his Jami'ah in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, Mu'ad bin Jabal as the Prophet ﷺ was instructing him, he then said to the Prophet ﷺ, O Sini Ya Rasulullah, please give me some advice on Messenger of Allah. And he, and he didn't say, Ansihni, O Sini. 
Like if this was the last advice you were going to give me, Ya Rasulullah, please, what would be the last advice that you give me? He said, Ittaqillaha haythu ma kunt. Be conscious of God no matter where or when or how you may be. The word haythu encompasses where, no matter where you are, always be conscious of God. In Medina, in the heart of Islam, amongst the Muslims, sitting next to the Messenger of Allah, be conscious of God. And even if you're out there in the boonies, in the fringes of the ummah, the fringes of the community at that time in Yemen, and you're the most knowledgeable person there, you're the leader there, you're in charge there, ittaqillah, still be conscious of God. No matter when, when it may be, it's now or tomorrow. No matter what the situation is, you're a follower here, you'll be a leader there. Always be conscious of God. And you'll be okay. Then he said, Zidni ya Rasulullah. Please give me more, O Messenger of Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ told him, Atbi'i sayyat al hasanata tamhuha. So beautiful. And look at how he's connecting it. So he said, Be conscious of God, live according to taqwa. Consciousness of God. Always be careful and cautious. But to err is human. And we are all human. We're not prophets. We're not ma'asum. We're not protected by Allah. So what's inevitably going to happen? No matter how cautious you try to be, what's inevitably going to happen? You're going to mess up. You're going to slip up. You're going to make a mistake. So he said, you will make mistakes. But what you need to remember when you make mistakes is redeem yourself. Follow that mistake with something good. Catch yourself. Recognize your mistake. Repent for it. And then do something good. Go give some charity. Go help somebody out. Go assist someone. Show some kindness to someone. And it will remove it. It will erase it. It will clean, cleanse you from it. Like the Qur'an says, in al-hasanati yudhibna sayyat. Good deeds remove sins and mistakes. He then said, Zidni ya Rasulullah, increase me, O Messenger of Allah. So the third piece of advice the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, this is, might be in terms of your interaction with God. So again, look at the coherence, the cohesiveness, the comprehensiveness of the advice of the Prophet. The third thing he tells him, and always deal with people with extremely beautiful and excellent character. Always interact with people in the most beautiful, exemplary way possible. Represent your faith. Represent your faith. This has so many different layers to it. Of course, the Prophet ﷺ says, أَثْقَلُ شَيْءِ فِي الْمِزَانِ حُسْنُ خُلُقِ The weightiest thing in the scales on the Day of Judgment is good character. So in and of itself, this is a good deed. So he's telling him one of the good ways to follow up after a mistake is practice good character. But at the same time, secondly, think about specifically Mu'ad bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He's being sent out to the outer, outer uh, edges of the ummah at that time. A lot of non-Muslims. He told them, إِنَّكَ سَدَاتِ قَوْمًا أَهْلَ كِتَابٍ You're about to go to a bunch of non-Muslims. So if you want to bring them to Islam, وَخَالِقِ النَّاسِ بِخُلُقٍ حَسَنٍ your character. Extremely powerful advice from the Prophet. ﷺ. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ increases some of the advice that he gives to Mu'ad bin Jabal. He, Mu'ad bin Jabal ta'ala anhu further asked the Prophet, ﷺ, Awsani ya Rasulullah. Give me more advice, O Messenger of Allah. Uh, no, so uh, Mu'ad bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala, excuse me, he says, Awsani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bi'ashri kalimatin. He said he gave me 10 pieces of advice. Number one, qala la tushrik billah. La tushrik billahi shay'an. Wa in qutilta wa hurriqta. He said, never ever associate a partner to God, even if you are killed, even if you are burned alive at the stake. Your faith is who you are and what you have. He said, number two, Do not humiliate and disrespect your parents. Even if they're asking you to do something very, very difficult, he didn't necessarily say that you have to exactly comply with what they're doing, but don't humiliate and disrespect them. There's a difference. There's a difference. 
You know, somebody's parents are telling them, hey, I want you to drive your car off a cliff. Obviously, don't do that. Right? That's common sense. Do not do that. But you don't have to humiliate them and, and ridicule them. Number three, He said, do not deliberately leave your prayer, obligatory prayer, fard salah. فَإِنَّ مَنْ تَرَكَ صَلَاةً مَكْتُوبَةً مُتَعَمِّدًا فَقَدْ بَرِئَتْ مِنْهُ ذِمَّةُ اللَّهِ Somebody who deliberately neglects their obligatory prayer, God, no, that person is no longer under the protection of God. God disavows that person. May Allah protect us. وَلَا تَشْرِبَنَّ خَمْرًا Never ever consume wine, intoxicants. Why? فَإِنَّهُ رَأْسُ كُلِّ فَاحِشَةٍ That is the... Head of all shamelessness and evil. He said, be very careful about committing sins, like falling into the habit of sin. Because when a person falls into the habit of committing sin, then that person becomes exposed to the wrath of God. And never ever flee the battlefield even if you are suffering defeat. And again, this doesn't mean in terms of strategy, where it might be a particular strategy, but it means deliberately like leaving your, bro your brothers in arms high and dry. So turning your back on them. If you are amongst the people and death comes upon the people, and you're amongst them. Like he's basically talking about an illness, an epidemic. Something like that occurs and you're already in them. Of course, the Prophet ﷺ also taught us about the practice of quarantine. If you're outside, don't go in. But he's saying if you're already in there, فَثْبُتْ Now stay. And do whatever good you can. And plus, don't go out because you might take that illness out. Quite profound. Then he says, وَأَنْفِقْ عَلَىٰ عِيَالِكَ مِنْ طَوْلِكَ to the best of your ability, spend your wealth on your family. Spend your wealth on your family. Be generous with your family. Be kind, be generous. And again, that, that, that's within reason. It's not talking about going broke, spending on unnecessary luxuries, but it's also talking about the element of not being so stingy where you cause hardship to your loved ones. وَلَا تَرْفَعْ عَنْهُمْ عَصَاكَ أَدَبًا It particularly also, it's kind of a metaphor but he's also talking about making sure that you also discipline your children. Don't spoil them rotten, but also have some element of discipline. وَأَخِفْهُمْ فِي اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ And lastly and finally, teach them the consciousness of God, the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make sure that they understand and they revere and they respect God's authority and power over them. That is very, very important. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ, in the Musa of Imam Ahmad, Mu'ad bin Jabr says that when the Prophet ﷺ was sending me to Yemen, he specifically told me, Iyaka wa tana'um. He said, be very careful about not becoming spoiled by luxury. Don't start to live an extravagant, luxurious lifestyle. Because he said, فَإِنَّ عِبَادَ اللَّهِ لَيْسُوا بِالْمُتَنَاعِمِينَ True servants of God do not chase after the luxuries of, and, and the opulence of this world. Because see, what it's talking about is here, it's not talking about deliberately living in hardship. Like if you can think about how cold it is outside right now. Okay, it's 40 degrees outside, it's cold. Now, you can afford to have a roof over your head. Or you can afford to have four walls around you. You can afford to have a heater on. But saying like, no, deliberately, spiritually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go live out in an open field in a tent with no heater. That's not Islam. Nor is that spirituality. This is a monasticism that God says we did not ever command them to do so. The Prophet said, La rahbaniyata fil Islam. That's not a part of religion of Islam. But that's one extreme. But also let's be cautious about the other extreme. 
We're not talking about just living a reasonable existence. We're talking about like chasing particularly after luxuries and opulence and glitz and glamour. Think about the amount of energy and time and effort and talent and ability that is expended in trying to do that and achieve that. Now think about how that time and that energy can be better spent. How that can be so much better spent. Living a meaningful existence. Doing good in this world, making the world a better place, helping other people. So that's what he's talking about, the true servants of God, Ibadur Rahman, like Allah describes them in the Quran. They're not people that chase after living a life of luxury and opulence. They're rather people who live a meaningful existence. So he's warning Mu'ad bin Jabal about that particularly, but also that's advice to uh, share with the people as well. And the last piece of kind of instruction that I'll mention here today, that the Prophet wasallam he gave to uh, Mu'ad bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, um, well, two, two last things. Number one is that the Prophet ﷺ also taught Mu'ad bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Al-Islamu yazid wa la yanqus. Always make sure that you are working towards increasing Islam and never, you know, decreasing Islam. Make sure the religion never becomes deficient due to you. But you always add something to the respectability of Islam. You contribute to spreading Islam. Never be the reason why people leave Islam. Always be the reason why people come to Islam. Al Islamu Yazid Walayan Hus. And that's something you have in Al Islam Yazid Walayan Hus. And he told Muhammad bin Jabr radiallahu ta'ala, you have to make sure of that. The other thing that's very interesting is that when Muhammad bin Jabr radiallahu ta'ala arrived in Yemen, the first prayer that he led the people there was Salat al Fajr. He arrived at night and he led them in Salat al-Fajr. In the morning prayer, he read the verses from Surah An-Nisa, in which he said, وَاتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ خَلِيلًا He read that verse. And one of the people who heard, because they were coming from Christianity and Judaism, Ahlul Kitab, when, he heard, when they heard him read these verses, in particular that verse, وَاتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ خَلِيلًا One of the people that was listening to the recitation during the prayer, he said, لَقَدْ قَرَّتْ عَيْنُ أُمِّ إِبْرَاهِيمَ he said that this probably brought great joy to the mother of Ibrahim. But it was his way of basically appreciating that the Muslims were honoring the Prophets of the past. See, the Prophet ﷺ taught this type of like intelligence and wisdom to his companions. That when, when, when Mu'ad bin Jabr radiallahu ta'ala anhu went there and he knew that there were Ahlul Kitab and he's leading the prayer and he knew they were all going to be listening. What does the Qur'an say? What does he recite? What do they say in their prayer? He recited the verse that praised Ibrahim alayhi salam. That God took Abraham as his close beloved friend. And they appreciated that they were respecting the prophets of the past. It's quite profound. Now the last big you know, instruction that the Prophet ﷺ gave to uh, Mu'ad bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and this is really, really profound. This narration is found in the Sunan of Abu Dawood, in the Jami of Imam Tirmidhi, in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad. It's an authentic narration in which the Prophet ﷺ has a conversation with Mu'ad bin Jabal. So this is almost like the quiz that he's giving him right before he departs. So he's been giving him, he's been teaching him for all these years, nine years, he gave him all this advice and now he quizzes him. And this quiz is really profound because this quiz is quite literally the foundation of Islamic law. What we call usulul fiqh, the principles of Islamic jurisprudence. This quiz, this conversation of the Prophet ﷺ with Mu'ad bin Jabal serves as a foundation of our usul, in our fiqh, in our uh, jurisprudence. He asked him, كَيْفَ تَصْنَعَ إِنْ عَرَضَ لَكَ قَضَاءٌ كَيْفَ تَصْنَعَ يَا مُعَذْ إِنْ عَرَضَ لَكَ قَضَاءٌ If you are, you, a case is brought to you. If a case is brought to you, there's a question, there's an issue, there's a dispute. كَيْفَ تَصْنَعَ What are you going to do? So Mu'adh bin Jabal رضي الله تعالى responds, أَقْضِي بِمَا فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ I will address the issue in light of what I find in the Book of God. I will look in the Qur'an and find the answer there. 
Now the Prophet ﷺ says something that is really profound and we all need to listen very carefully. And for a lot of Muslims, it's, some, it's a huge learning opportunity. He says, فَإِلَّمْ يَكُنْ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ The Prophet ﷺ says, what if the answer to the question you're being asked is not in the Qur'an? Now somebody might say, what are you talking about? Everything's in the Qur'an. Qur'an is everything. وَتَفْصِيلَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ what are you talking about? What do you mean the Qur'an is not enough for... No, no, no. He's talking about the explicit answer to a question. There's a difference. In terms of principles, ethics, everything is addressed in the Qur'an. It gives an umbrella. It gives a framework. Okay? But in terms of explicit, specific answers, he says, What if it's not in the Qur'an? He says, قَالَ فَبِسُنَّةِ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. I will then look in the practice and the tradition of the Messenger of God. The Sunnah. Now look what the Prophet ﷺ says. And again, blow your hair back. He says, فَإِلَّمْ يَكُنْ فِي سُنَّةِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ The Prophet ﷺ says, what if you don't find the answer in the Sunnah? Now somebody on the internet just had a fit. What do you mean it's not the Sunnah? Everything's in the Sunnah. Right? No, 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 but that's not what the Prophet said. Again, principles, ethics, a framework is given to us. But the explicit answer to every question is not going to be there. That's an unreasonable expectation. So he's saying the answer specifically, explicitly, is not given in the Sunnah. Then what are you going to do? So Mu'ad bin Jabal ta'ala anhu, he says, Ajtahidu bi ra'yi. I will then apply my intellect. Ijtihad, what we call. Scholarly analysis. What is scholarly academic analysis? You look at the Quran, you look at the Sunnah, you look at the principles, the ethics, the guidelines, similar scenarios laid out in the Quran, the principles, the guidelines, the ethics, and similar scenarios addressed in the Sunnah. And then by looking at that, you study that, you dissect it, you analyze it, and then you find an answer, a solution to this particular issue that you are faced with. And he said, Wala alu. And I will not, like I will exhaust all my efforts in doing so. I will persist. La al. I will persist. When the Prophet ﷺ heard this answer, the quiz was applied. What was the grade he got? فَدَّرَبَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ Mu'ad bin Jabal says the Prophet ﷺ patted me on the chest. Good job. Good man. And he said, ثُمَّ قَالْ أَلْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي وَفَّقَ رَسُولَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ لِمَا يُرْضِي رَسُولَ اللَّهِ All praises for God, the one who guided the ambassador, the representative of the messenger of God, to know what to do in a way that would be... And so he approved literally serves as the foundation for the entire science, the discipline of what we call usul al-fiqh. So profound and so beautiful. Now as beneficial as this entire conversation was, and as much as we benefited from it, the conversation concluded, the conversation concluded with something very, very The conversation concluded with something that is very heart-wrenching. It's very heart-wrenching. The way this particular conversation concluded was that when Mu'ad bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu was heading out, he says, Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, خَرَجَ مَعَهُ يُصِيهِ and the Rasulullah Yusihi. He says the Prophet exited Medina with me. He would see people off, he would see people in. The Prophet was a very gracious person. So he said he walked me out, kept giving me advice, kept giving me advice, kept giving me advice. And he said eventually he told me, all right, now time to get on the ride. Time to head out. So I figured this was where he was going to see me off from. So I got on the ride, expecting the Prophet was just going to wave at me and salaam alaikum, and then I would head off. 
But then after I got on the ride, the Prophet ﷺ took the reins of the camel. He took the reins of the camel and he started walking. And Mu'adh bin Jabal said, I felt very uncomfortable. Obviously, he's a messenger of God. But he said, stay. I need to talk to you about something. And then he told him, he said, Ya Mu'adh, إِنَّكَ عَسَىٰ أَلَّا تَلْقَانِي بَعْدَ عَامِي هَذَا Mu'adh, you might not meet me again. You might not meet me again. And then he said, وَلَعَلَّكَ أَن تَمُرَّ بِمَسْجِدِ هَذَا وَقَبْرِي He said, the next time you come and you pass by my masjid, you will also find my grave. وَلَعَلَّكَ أَن تَمُرَّ بِمَسْجِدِ هَذَا وَقَبْرِي And Mu'adh رضي الله تعالى عنه, he said, فَبَكَى مُعَاذٌ جَشَعًا Mu'adh رضي الله تعالى عنه, he said, he cried like a child cries. Like sobbing and weeping. You know how a child cries? No holds barred. We as adults try to restrict it and hold it. He said, Mu'adh just fell apart. لِفِرَاقِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. For the separation of the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم. That this would be the last moment he would see the Prophet صلى الله عليه But you know what the Prophet صلى told him? He said, لَا تَبْكِي يَا مُعَاد Do not cry, friend. Do not cry, يَا مُعَاد He said, لِلْبُكَاءِ أَوَانٌ There are times for crying. وَالْبُكَاءُ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ But crying right now, that's shaitan distracting you. I need you to focus on the mission. You got work to do. There will be a time. You can mourn me and cry for me later. Right now I need you to do your job. You got work to do. Think about what he would have given to just stay. Share some last few moments with the Prophet But this is what the Prophet taught the Ummah. We got work to do. But what did the Prophet ﷺ tell his companions? What did he tell his family members? What did he tell the people who sacrificed even earlier in Mecca? Like he told the family of Yasir. Sabran ala Yasir, in the mawa'idakum al-jannah. We'll all be together in paradise. We will be together. We'll be together in paradise. But right now, we got work to do. And in fact, that's exactly what all the books of hadith, seerah, history all document. That Mu'adh bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu kadhalika waqa'a He did not meet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam again فَإِنَّهُ أَقَامَ بِالْيَمَنْ حَتَّى كَانَتْ حَجَّةُ الْوِدَاعِ He stayed in Yemen to do the job the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had given him حَجَّةُ الْوِدَاعِ happened ثُمَّ كَانَتْ وِفَاتُهُ sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away 81 days after the Hajj And Mu'adh bin Jabal was still in Yemen And he would eventually return back to Medina Exactly as the Prophet ﷺ told him, he would return back to Medina when Abu Bakr was Khalifa and the Prophet ﷺ had departed from this world. And later on, Mu'adh bin Jabal would be sent by Abu Bakr to Asham to continue the work that the Prophet ﷺ had trained him for and continued to spread and teach Islam. So this is that very remarkable conversation and moment when the Prophet وسلم, he sent Mu'adh bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu to Yemen to go there and teach the people as it mentions وسلم, he was the Qadi of the people the Islamic judge of the people Hakiman fil Hurum to govern over them and lead them uh, and he was also the distributor of charity ilayhi tudfa'u sadaqat they would, he would gather the zakat and distribute it amongst the people. وَقَدْ كَانَ بَارِزًا لِلنَّاسِ يُصَلِّ بِهِمَ الصَّلَوَاتِ الْخَمْسِ He used to go out and lead the people in the five times daily prayers, just exactly as the Prophet ﷺ had instructed him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him. And uh, with that, inshallah, we conclude. Let's try to remember all the remarkable, beautiful advice the Prophet ﷺ gave. And as powerful and profound as the love of the Prophet ﷺ is, a true expression of his love is to do what he asked us to do. Like he said, there are times where it is appropriate to just sit and cry. 
But then there's time to get up and roll up your sleeves and do the good work of the Messenger Sallallahu And that's an important part of his legacy and an important part of what he instructed us to do. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala allow us all to be ambassadors, true ambassadors of the Prophet Sallallahu And may Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala give us the ability, grant us the ability to practice everything we've said and heard. Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta, nasaghfirika wa natubu ilayk.